Good evening. Welcome to this tree identification program for beginners. We're pleased that so many of you have joined us here this evening. I'm Mike Fargione. I'm the manager of field research and outdoor programs here at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. The Cary Institute is an independent ecological research and educational organization. We're located in southeastern New York, and our scientists study how ecosystems function and how humans impact those ecosystems. First, a few mechanics. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find the chat function. We'd invite you to use the chat to introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from. Feel free to share why you're interested in tonight's topic, if you've attended any of our tree ID programs in the past, or if this is your first time joining us for this subject. Often the most successful projects are those where people work together, and tonight's program is really no exception. It's been a pleasure to develop this presentation collabor collaboratively with Brian Strandini, Strandini and Julie Hart of Duchess Land Conservancy. As we approach the end of another long Northeastern winter, we're all looking forward to getting outside and learning to explore and understand better the natural world. Well, let's not wait any longer. We're gonna to start tonight by learning to identify some common North uh, New England and New York trees. Normally this is a three hour in-person workshop that we host with walks in the forests and samples of trees that we collect and show people, let them touch and identify and try to key out. We're expecting to get back to that format soon. We're hoping to do some in-person tree identification walks later this year. However, this virtual format does provide some opportunities for us to reach a larger audience like tonight. And although we're presenting things virtually tonight, we did make a short video to try and provide that in the woods experience you'd see if we were out together. We'll be turning off the chat uh, function in a few minutes, not to worry. You can type your questions into the Q&A feature and we'll be looking at them and answering as many as we can at the, at the end of this presentation. You can also uh, get closed captioning at the bottom of your screen as well with a live transcript if you choose to, to check that box. There's no need to take notes tonight. Uh, we'll be sending you a link with a recording of this presentation. So just sit back and enjoy. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Brian. All right, thank you for much, sir. Uh, starting us off, Mike, I really appreciate it. So tonight's program is Tree Identification for Beginners, and it's hosted by uh, myself, Julie Hart, uh, from the Duchess Land Conservancy, and Mark, Mike Fargione from the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. So thanks again for joining us tonight. So a quick overview on where we're headed tonight. We're going to do an introduction to tree ID and essentially why trees, why are we focused on this. And then we're going to learn how to use a simple ID key uh, to help us identify keys in the field. And then we're going to go into some identification of alternate branching deciduous trees, evergreens, and opposite branching deciduous trees. And if you don't know what that means, we'll, we're going to get into that very shortly. Uh, and then followed up by some Q&A at the end, which we'll try to save some time for. But we have a lot of great information. So just really quickly about the Duchess Land Conservancy. Hopefully some of y'all here are familiar with us, but for anyone who's not, uh, we are a nonprofit land conservation organization located in the Hudson Valley of New York. Uh, just down the road from Cary, actually, and we're dedicated to preserving the farms, forest, wetlands and waterways, open spaces, and wildlife habitat in Dutchess County. Uh, we are an accredited land trust founded in uh, 1985, and since then we've worked with hundreds of landowners to protect almost uh, over 44,000 acres. So then another disclaimer at the beginning, I just went, kind of wanted to talk about why a social scientist has teamed up with a ecologist and a biologist on a tree ID webinar. Um, so at one point in my career, I was asked to compose an article about trees and what they meant to me. And I was very nervous thinking about, uh, since I don't really know the hard science behind things. Shortly after that, on a hike with my kid, uh, we were looking at trees and I was talking about the interdependency of humans and trees and how our actions or inactions can reshape the natural world. 
And we all know that trees provide habitat, um, lumber for our homes. They can act as uh, outdoor recreation and mindful spaces. Uh, however, I've recently learned that trees are communal and just like us thrive in interdependent relationships similar to humans. If you're interested in that topic, I can't recommend the book, The Hidden Life of Trees enough. It kind of supported me in writing that article and give me the information that trees essentially are communal and talk to each other by sharing nutrition via underground symbiotic fungal networks. And I find this really to be a beautiful metaphor to the human condition that we thrive on our own. Uh, we don't so much thrive on our own, but we thrive in communities. So a quick overview, we talked about um, uh, twigs before a little bit, but we're starting this adventure looking at branches and why? Well, if you look out your window right now, you probably don't see a lot of leaves on the trees. So we're going to focus tonight from the macro to the micro on, on different tools in your toolbox to identify trees. So the three things we're looking at in the middle, obviously, we have a needled branch. Uh, so probably some kind of evergreen tree. And then on the right side, we have a branch that has opposite branching, meaning the two branches are growing out on the same side of the main branch. Whereas on the left side, we have uh, alternate branching where the the little nubs are kind of growing out on alternate sides. So it's a good indicator of, well, you know, starting place to what you look at. So why are we bothering with this? Well, because trees matter. As I mentioned, they can provide habitat for wildlife, uh, forest products for our homes and infrastructure, and outdoor recreation. I don't know about you, but in the past two and a half years, I've been spending a lot of time outdoors. And trees work hard. They generate and preserve soils. They can actually act as uh, larger car carbon sinks than the trees themselves. They filter and purify our drinking water. They produce oxygen and filter air, and they act as erosion control. So essentially holding the land in place to avoid landslides and they maintain clarity in the water or turbidity. Trees are communal, and this is my favorite aspect. So both above ground and under, trees can work together uh, Again, scientists are just beginning to scrape together the information about forest intelligence and social networks. In the past, we used to think of trees as kind of disconnected, uh, competing for nutrients and sunlight. Um, and this can kind of play into a negative uh, view of them as thinking of like kind of a survival of the fittest. However, trees uh, thrive when connectivity thrives. Um, and actually, I love this picture on the right because if you look up at the forest canopy, you can witness the lack of competitiveness that trees perform to not shade each other out. So it's kind of more of a survival of the supported as they communicate uh, underground through these symbiotic fungal networks and uh, not shade each other out. So again, it's kind of that beautiful metaphor back to the human condition that you know humans are thought to live longer when we have our our roots deep in the community and family and friends and supporting each other and trees also share that same community network. Also, trees are cool, quite literally. Uh, they provide shading and cooling for humans and flora and fauna alike. They're endlessly interesting and can have universes them on, on them themselves and they make for very good neighbors. If you have never embraced a tree, I recommend going outside after this and doing so, while also embracing the stereotype that comes along with uh, hugging trees. So let's begin these, let's start to meet these potential hug recipients. When I look at this picture, I can get a little nervous. I kind of one of those people that wants to be the instant expert and go out in the field and identify every tree we see here. But we have a lot of different species in the Northeast. So a good place to start, one tree at a time. I can also get a little nervous when thinking about the different tools in my toolbox. So there's lots of different uh, field guides, there's beginner guides, advanced guides, uh, ones based on seasonality, bark, all sorts of different things. But these are all consideration of the tools for your toolbox. It's, it's all part of a process of, of working knowledge and, and building your knowledge slowly over time. And of course, there's an app for that. The main two apps that folks tend to use are Seek from iNaturalist and LeafSnap. Tonight, and in our video as we go through, we're going to focus on the Seek app. Uh, I find it to be really handy. It's very good at identifying leaves and flowers, but you can get a mixed reaction on bark. So given the seasonality of things, uh, you'll, you'll see how it works out. It works out pretty good some of the times. So download the app to your smartphone. It's, it's very intuitive, so I won't stick around for too long on this. Take a photo, 
you kind of hold it in front of what you're looking at, it becomes pretty sure of itself as those green bars fill up and it thinks it's looking at an oak leaf. And then the green bars fill up all the way and it's very sure of itself that we're looking at a northern red oak. You can also record the picture and help better inform the scientific community about where species are located and learn more about the tree yourself. So why are we bothering with this? Uh, trees are in trouble through disease and insects. Uh, trees are definitely in trouble. These ecosystems are fragile and complex and reliant on biodiversity. And it tends to be with biodiversity when you want, remove one species, other species tend to have a domino effect. And guess what? You and I are also part of that complex ecosystem. In addition to hindering forest and orchard products, uh, they, can they can negatively impact uh, the forest's ability to sequester carbon. So since these insects and diseases became dominant during, uh, since humans have been circumnavigating the globe, it's kind of us to start, uh, up to us to help prevent these uh, ailments to the trees. So be a Lorax, do what you can do to support this. If you have any land, make sure you're identifying the things, the diseases or insects that could be on your land. And if you're moving firewood across uh, state lines, make sure you know your local area's rules. And seasonal variation too. This can be a little bit daunting as well, whether the trees have leaves on them or not. Um, whether there's, you know, they're producing uh, reproductive nuts like acorns. I think that that can be a little bit daunting, but they can all act as clues to help you identify trees. Again, it's from the macro to the micro. So thinking about the holistic view of looking at the macro to the micro, trees can have distinctive character. Here's an easy ID, ID when you're walking up on a tree. Here's a tree, that's not a tree. Here's another way to look at it. So when you're walking up on a tree, you might see its large silhouette. You can see two silhouettes here that are likely pretty easy to identify as a whole. Obviously, we're looking at Indiana Jones and Darth Vader. So you can tell that just by their silhouettes, right? Or you could get down a little bit more into the micro and look at maybe Indy's hat or his whip or Darth Vader's signature helmet or cape. These are all ways to look at it. And then if there weren't silhouettes in the actual images, you could obviously recognize Indiana's face and maybe the little buttons on Darth Vader's armor or something to those lines. And just a note here that we will be using these stars, these red stars and arrows to help us as we go through the um, some micro characteristics later on in the slideshow. So same thing with trees. You can take a look at their silhouette as you're walking toward them and start to get a, a, a decent idea on what you're looking at. It's not always gonna get you right there, but again, it's another tool in your toolbox, more on the macro level. Getting further down into the micro, you can look at the distinctive characteristics of the bark. Bark can be smooth or furrowed, uh, platy, and, and have var variable coloration. So getting down a little bit farther into the weeds. And then as mentioned at the top of the program, down further into the micro, looking at the opposite and alternate branching of the trees or if it has needle needles on it. Um, some branches can even have distinctive budding and even smells. And depending on the season, you can likely find some reprodu reproductive characteristics of the tree, be they on the tree or on the ground by the tree if some uh, little forest friends have already uh, nibbled them up. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna head into the woods. We got some tools in our toolbox. We're gonna use our cell phone app. We're gonna use our brains. I'm kind of playing the, the layman tonight because I know more about the uh, social ecological factors of nature. Uh, so it's a really fun video and we had a lot of good time doing it. So I am going to quickly stop sharing my screen and open up the video. Being that I know a little bit about tree identification better in the summertime than in the winter and spring, I would say that what we're looking at here is some kind of oak, but I'm gonna take out my Seek app. Yeah, let's see what Seek thinks. Again, gotta move around sometimes. Sometimes you have a situation of if you're facing the sun, it's not very happy because it is a camera. We are getting oak. So me and Seek, are on the same page so far. <laughs> so 
But that's about as far as I'm getting. But since there are some uh, mm -hmm. leaves yeah. hanging around here, yeah. they kind of help prove my theory a little bit. Say an oak leaf. What do you think? <laughs> I am down with the oak theory. Yeah, this oaks are actually pretty easy to tell apart by their bark. And so we have several species that are really common in our area. And the bark's always pretty distinctive. So this one has that very characteristic um, bark of a white oak. So it has this kind of chunky, ridgy, light gray kind of color to it. And it's pretty consistent all the way up the tree. It's a very similar color. That light gray really kind of jumps out at you in this very chunky pattern is, is very characteristic of a, of a white oak. And as you can see on the ground, there's a couple different species of oak leaves that are here. Mm -hmm. So this is the one that belongs to the white oak. It has very rounded lobes on the leaf. So you'll see that on all the trees in the white oak family. They all have rounded leaves. So there are also a lot of red oak leaves on the ground here. So there must be one of those nearby as well. Let's go see if we can find a red oak to explain where all of these red oak leaves come from. And I think this may be the tree that dropped all of the leaves that we found over there by the white oak. So what do you remember about identifying red oak trees? Red oak trees from white oak trees. Uh, again, my brain goes to the leaf, but what I know about the bark is that there's kind of more of a flat surface, almost mm -hmm. like tracks going up and down that are usually easier to see on an older tree the higher up yep. you look. Yep, very good. And this tree has those exact marks that look just like ski tracks, kind of a flat, lighter gray area of the bark that runs up. And like you said, it's a lot more obvious the higher up you look on the tree. So yeah, this is a great big red oak tree, and that's what's dropped all these leaves. So this one, in contrast to what we looked at before, has these really pointed lobes on it. And on the red oak, you'll see each one of those lobes ends with an almost hair-like projection on the end of it. So let's see how Seek does with these leaves. You want to set them both down on the ground and we'll see I do. if we can I've get them. I've had a really great luck with this app and leaf identification and flower identification, mm -hmm. insect identification. We're in the sun here a little bit, so I'm just going to move it aside. Yep. Yeah, white oak. All right, try that one. I'll put this one on the snow. It's a good backdrop. And out of the sun. And red oak. All right. So we've supported our theory and identified strengths of different tools in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've identified a couple of very lovely oak trees. Is there anything else uh, down near the soil that we could find to help us identify an oak tree? You know, there might be some acorns. At this time of year, there might not be a lot of them. Looks like we the have some critters squirrel, will have eaten a lot. Squirrel fun here. Yep. Some, oh, yeah. Some caps and. Yep shells yeah what's left of an acorn yep but these these are what's left of the red oak acorns and the thing that really distinguishes the red oak because acorns are all kinds of sizes and shapes and there's a fair amount of variability within a species um, but red oaks always have this very flattened kind of cap on them i think of it as like a beret like it's wearing a little hat <laughs> And so this is what the red oak caps look like on their acorns. And we'll have to look around and see if we can find some other species of oaks and compare acorn caps. Excellent. Let's, let's, move let's go on. see. So keeping with our oak theme here, this to me looks a lot like some of the bark we've looked at mm -hmm. already yep. and the other two species. But what I'm noticing here is this kind of deeply furrowed and more, for lack of a better term, chunky bark. 
And when we're talking about tools, one of the tools we're talking about is the field guide to help us identify the bark. And this field guide is leading me to believe that this would be a chestnut oak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's another one of the common oak species that we have around here. It's one of my very favorite trees because it does have this really distinctive, ridgy, chunky bark that doesn't really look like anything else that grows around here. Um, so a couple other things to look for for the chestnut oak. So this is a tree that is in the same family with a white oak, which means that it has rounded lobes on the leaves. So you remember we looked at the white oak leaf before, which had, you know, kind of much deeper grooves in it. Mm. And this one is a little more, I always call it the cookie cutter tree because it reminds me of that sort of scallop edge cookie cutter that my mom always used to make mm -hmm. sugar cookies. So this is a very characteristic leaf of a chestnut oak. And the other thing that I found on the ground is the caps of the acorns. So the acorns are gone. Somebody's probably eaten those already. But this are the, is the caps of that chestnut oak acorn. And you can see that in contrast to the red oak caps, these are a lot deeper. So where the red oak looks like a beret, these ones look like a hat that we are both wearing, which Americans typically, typically call a beanie. But just shout out to all the Canadians in the room today. <laughs> you and I both know that these are called toques, and that is what these remind me of. So those are the things you always look for with a chestnut oak. The acorns are wearing toques, and the leaves have the rounded lobes, and the bark is furrowed and chunky. I'm getting a multicultural lesson. Yes, exactly. It. Trees are multicultural. So, Brian, we've talked about a lot of deciduous trees so far, but here is an evergreen. And uh, let's, let's see if we can figure out what this one is. Sure. You mind if I try my faithful app here? Absolutely. So I'm going to try to move around it a little bit. It right away is telling me that it's an eastern hemlock tree. Good. That's so, very good. I'd agree. Excellent. Yeah. We have a lot of characteristics here we can look at to see that it's an eastern hemlock. Uh, first, of course, as we've already indicated, it's a, an evergreen tree. The leaves stay on, the needles stay on mm -hmm. all year long. Uh, there happen to be some close by that we can look at. And if we look at them, we can tell many of the conifers apart by the kinds of leaves or needles they have. Um, if the needles are in groups or bundles, we often think of those as the pines. Mm. When the needles are individually placed on a branch, then that could be hemlocks or spruces or firs. In this case, um, we know that these needles are singular and they're on a flat plane coming from either side of the twig. And if we turn over those needles and look at them, there's a white stripe on either side of the mid line of them. And okay. so all of those are a great way to tell us this is an eastern hemlock. The bark is pretty characteristic, has narrow flaky ridges that seem like they could flake off. And as the tree gets older, this bark gets much redder and with much deeper furrows. A really important tree in our uh, forest communities, it provides shade. It's often found like we do see it here with uh, with other hemlocks or other hardwoods. Um, it's particularly common on eastern and northern slopes mm -hmm. where it survives very well. It shades a lot of streams and provides uh, important uh, thermoregulation or control of temperature, particularly for fish and other things that live in those streams. By shading the water, it keeps it cool. A lot of our trout streams um, are trout streams in part because hemlocks provide shade to them. So it sounds like it's a pretty important species that's part of a larger network of things that are important to humans and animals alike. Yep, yep. This is a good one to know. Yeah. Excellent. Let's find some more. Thanks. Tell us. Okay, I'm going to use the Seek app and hit the photo button. And like I said earlier, it takes a little bit of movement around before it identifies or attempts to identify the species. And what I'm getting pretty automatically is a shagbark hickory. Okay. 
Let's try a look at this tree and see if we would agree with it. If we had a branch down low, we would notice a couple of things. One is that the branches are coming out in opposite formation. Um, and so that tells us that the app probably misidentified this one. It's, it's not a hickory, which has alternate leaves and alternate buds and branches. So this is one of those opposite branch trees. Um, so it's probably a maple, an ash, or maybe one of the buckeyes. But the most common trees we have here in eastern New York State uh, that are opposite are sugar maples and red maples. If we look at this tree in particular, we see that the bark has these big plates and that the plates separate away from the bark typically only on one side. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a good indication that this is actually a sugar maple. So that's one way of distinguishing these trees by their bark. Platy uh, structures and the plates separate away at one side. If we could get and reach some of the buds up higher, we'd see uh, some characteristics of the buds and the twigs themselves um, that would tell us it's a sugar maple. But the fact that it's opposite branching, opposite buds, and the bark characteristics we see here tells us that this is actually a sugar maple. So that must have been a tough one for the app in these light conditions. Yeah, and I think that the app has trouble with just bark on occasions, especially okay. if there's comparable ones. I think it really shines with leaves. Um, and thinking that uh, a maple leaf is pretty easy to identify for most folks, I would say. Yeah. Can we find any um, evidence on the ground to prove your hypothesis? Well, it's always tricky to do that <laughs> because you don't know if what I pick up came from this particular tree. But here's one, and it actually has two different things. Uh, it has a leaf, and if we look closely at that, we see it actually has the shape of the symbol on the Canadian flag, which is the sugar maple. And we also see half of a, a seed pod from, from a maple. Um, these are called Samaras. And so if you look at that, you can see uh, that that's an also an indicator that at least there's some maples in this area. And if you were to look closely at that seed, you would see if you had a key that it tells you it, you could identify it out as a sugar maple versus some other kind of maple. So at least we have some supporting evidence down here that there's some maples in the area. So that makes me feel even better. Well, let's go look at another tree, okay? Sounds great. Okay, Brian, here's another one. Let's take a look at this. What do you think this one is? Well, you know, it makes me think about the sugar maple we were looking at. Um, and I would really have a tough time thinking about the bark far away from this as opposed to a sugar maple. But up close, I'm noticing that the bark is coming away on both sides, whereas you said the sugar maple is coming apart on one side. Do you mind if I give it the old Seek Let's try? Let's see what Seek thinks. All right. Now it's telling me, just as it did with the sugar maple, really quickly, it's, t it's IDing a shag bark hickory. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. This is really one of those trees, is if you get a good specimen, there's no question about what you're looking at. And as you mentioned, the bark does come off in plates on this. You do see ridges that come away from the trunk, like you saw with the sugar maple. Mm -hmm. But in the sugar maple, they were coming away only on one side of the plate. With shag bark, sometimes the top, but often the bottom of the plates peel way off and become separated from the trunk. And that's really characteristic of shag bark hickory. This one is uh, one you won't mistake for anything else if you get a good example like this. Yeah. If we look around on the ground, we can find some other evidence that it, that's what we're looking at. Shag bark hickories also have what we call mast or nuts. Um, and you can tell them from other hickories by the husks or the, the uh, woody, corky material that surrounds the nut itself. So these are some examples of shagbark hickory, nuts, husk. And you can see how thick they are. And that would be uh, a real key characteristic to tell us this was from a shagbark hickory, not from one of the other species of hickories we have around here, like pig nut or mocker nut. 
So I think Seek was right on. That's exactly what we're looking at, a shag bark hickory. Excellent. It's cool to see the, the different dynamics that uh, the app can portray and that uh, we can reinforce or prove wrong by what we find on the ground, especially in the wintertime. And it's amazing to me how much you can tell just by the bark without having the leaves or the twigs even. So with a little practice, you can learn a lot. All right, thanks everyone for coming along on that little hike with us to apply the skills we've learned earlier and uh, use some expertise to help us ID some trees and all the using the tools in our toolbox. Next, I would like to pass it along to my colleague, Julie Hart, who will be teaching us to use uh, dichotomous key, which we kind of started to talk about a little bit in the beginning. Julie, go ahead. Thank you, Brian, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight for this webinar. We really appreciate having such a great audience. Um, so my name is Julie Hart. I'm an ecologist and an educator here at the Duchess Land Conservancy. And I'm going to first give you a quick walkthrough of the use of a dichotomous key to identify trees. And then I'll cover some of the more common deciduous and alternate branching leaves that we have here in our area. So Brian had mentioned the field guides that we use. And Many of these are, they're, they're set up in a lot of different ways, some of them by shape of the leaves or color in the fall. Um, dichotomous key is a specific type of um, field guide that allows you to go through a step-by-step -step process to figure out what a tree is. So these two in the upper right, those tree finders are both examples of dichotomous keys. Now using a key can at first seem a little bit intimidating. Um, there's a lot of different ways that they're set up, but it's really, if you think of it as a choose your own adventure book, it's very much along that structure. So it's structured in couplets. So there'll be a question with two possible answers and you pick the one that is most, um, most clearly describes what you're looking at. And that takes you to another question. So here's a couple of examples. The one on the left is actually from a tree guide that my dad had when he was a little boy. So this was published in probably the 1940s. Um, and the one on the right is from a tree guide that I was using in my botany class in college. But like I said, they're all set up basically the same way. You have these couplets where you are, it's looking at uh, a, you know, two possible answers. So you always start with number one. And in this case, just as an example, we're gonna be keying out the twig in the top right corner. Um, pretty simple, straightforward one, just to show you how this works. So question number one, are the leaves evergreen or are they deciduous? Well, obviously these are evergreen. That takes us to number two. So we're looking now at the shape of them. Are they broad and flat or are they linear, needle-like, scale-like, or all-like? So these look pretty needle-like to me. That takes me down to question number five. And then the question is, is it needle-like or other than needle-like? And by that, they just are referring back to the previous question where the other options were things like scale-like or all-like. So these look pretty needle-like to me. So I'm gonna choose that one. Takes me to number six. And now I'm looking at how those leaves are arranged on the twig. And so because this is a picture on your screen, you can't tell, but believe me, if you had this in your hand, you would be able to see that these leaves are arranged in bundles of five. And so that tells you that it's a pine. And in this key, you would go to page 49, which would allow you to figure out exactly which species of pine it is. And so I gave you that just as a very basic example of how to use a dichotomous key. The important thing is to not get discouraged if it gives you an answer that's clearly completely crazy. That happens to all of us when we're using dichotomous keys. Um, don't let it worry you. Just go back to the beginning and try again. Sometimes it's really difficult to tell which, which um, of the two options fits your twig uh, most closely. And there is a lot of variability on trees in terms of you know, size and shape of structures. So trees, you know, there are, they are a lot like people. They're highly variable. They have their own personalities. And, and Brian, I'm glad you focused on kind of the, the benefits of spending time outdoors and especially in the woods. Um, a dear friend of mine likes to say that everybody should spend at least 20 minutes a day in the woods and the world would be a much better place. And if you don't have time to spend 20 minutes in the woods a day, you should be spending an hour in the woods every day. So I'm going to start running you fairly quickly through some of the common 
deciduous alternate branching trees that we have in our area. And after that, Mike is going to cover some of the common um, opposite branching and evergreen species that we have. Now, some of these were already covered in the video, so I'll go through these pretty quickly. And again, don't feel like you have to take notes. We're gonna be providing you with these PowerPoints um, after the webinar, we'll be sending those and making them available to you. So, um, so first we'll compare and contrast the Northern Red Oak and the Eastern White Oak. So both oak trees, they're both gonna be pretty tall, sturdy trees when they're fully grown and provide food for wildlife by way of the acorn crops that they produce. Where they grow can be a little bit different. Um, red oaks tend to grow more on the uplands, on hilltops and hill slopes, whereas white oaks tend to grow more in the bottomlands. They like those rich, moist soils. The twigs, honestly, I'm going to be totally honest with you here. I'm not great with twig identification for a very good reason, which is that I work in a lot of forests where most of the twigs are 50 feet up in the air. So, there, there are some basic things that you can look at here. Um, oaks tend to have a cluster of buds at the tip of the twig. So those are going to become this year's leaves when they emerge in the springtime. But in general, oak twigs are, you know, kind of stout. The red oaks are a little stouter than the white oaks, but so much variability. You know, I'm, I'm feeling good if I can look at a twig and say, oh, look at the cluster of buds at the tip. That's an oak. The acorns are fairly distinctive from species to species, but again, a lot of variability there. So you'll remember that the red oak acorns have those little berets that they wear on their heads and the white oak acorns a little bit smaller and they have a slightly deeper cap. But for me, it's the bark that's really the distinguishing characteristic for the oak tree. So you'll remember in the video, we looked at the bark of the red oak, the white oak and the chestnut oak. And here's the red oak. Um, the one on the left shows a young tree, which has kind of greenish bark with furrows showing a little bit of a reddish underbark. And the adult trees are extremely um, easy to spot because they have this ski track pattern that's very, very characteristic. If you don't see it at the bottom of the trunk, look up and you might see those ski tracks. And that tells you that it's a white oak, or I'm sorry, a red oak. The white oak, in contrast, has a much lighter gray bark and from young trees to old trees has a very similar pattern, these thin flaky vertical stripes that's you know, kind of chunky and flaky, uh, but it has that very distinctive pattern that's so different from the red oak. And that tells you very quickly what you're looking at. So moving on to another tree that's pretty easy to spot, the American beech. Now these, especially when they're young, do tend to hold onto their leaves in the winter. So that's what you're looking at in this photo. That's a quality call, called marcescence. Um, it just means that the tree is not shedding those leaves in the fall. Um, beech are pretty common in our landscape and those beech nuts can be a source of food for, the, for wildlife. The twigs on beech are really distinctive. They're extremely pointy. If you're walking through a thicket of young beech trees, you probably wanna wear eye protection. Um, so that's an easy thing to spot on the lower branches. And in a tree that's bearing fruit, you'll see those beech nuts with their kind of spiny husks on them. But the thing about beeches that's always gonna scream to you that it's a beech tree is the bark. So from young trees to old trees, really, really smooth, light gray bark, except in a beech tree that is suffering from beech bark disease. And that has been spreading through our area for quite some time. And it causes these blisters and cankers to form so that otherwise smooth bark turns into this really kind of horrific um, texture of, of disease. So that is also pretty easy to recognize. Now the black cherry is another common species in our area. Its shape is similar to other trees. So I, I find the general overall shape isn't very helpful in identifying a black cherry. But one thing that will often be visible is in the photo on the right, those kind of growths on the branches. That's a black knot disease. And that's very common. It does tend to be pretty specific to cherry trees, at least as far as our forest trees go. Now the cherry seeds are dispersed by birds. So you do tend to find these growing in you know, hedgerows and woods, places where birds perch. The twigs are, I'm just gonna say pretty nondescript. I've never identified a cherry tree based on its twig, 
but later on in the growing season, you'll see the fruit kind of dangling in these little clusters of, of dark, dark purple cherry fruits. But again, to me, it's the bark that really helps me distinguish a cherry tree. The younger trees are a little difficult because it has this reddish brown bark with these pale lenticels, which are like little um, gas exchange holes in the bark. And we'll see that those, that particular pattern is an awful lot like young birch trees. So that can be very difficult to distinguish on the younger trees. But the older trees have this, this very distinguishable bark that, you know, the phrase you usually hear it described as burnt potato chips. So it's kind of a darker gray brown with a little bit of reddish in its bark with rounded edges as it flakes off the tree. And it does, you know, when you look at it, it take my word for it, it looks kind of like burnt potato chips. That's how we always kind of look at those trees. Now the birches can be a little bit tricky, um, but they're fairly different from each other. So gray birch and paper birch have a very similar growth habit, both tall and slender. The twigs honestly aren't all that different. The arrangement of catkins can be a little bit different from species to species, but there's a, some variability on, you know, from twig to twig also. So again, I don't tend to rely on twigs for identifying birches. Seeds, again, not easy to identify a birch by the seeds unless you've got a hand lens with you to look at them because they're quite small. So what you're looking at here is a mix of the seeds and the bracts, which are the parts of the cone that have broken apart to release the seeds. So for me, it's always the bark for the birches. A gray birch has a white bark that can often be mistaken for paper birch, but it always has these blackish chevron shaped um, marks at the base of each branch. In contrast with the paper birch, which has this very broadly peeling also white bark, but the way the bark um, looks is very, very different. On a paper birch, it's always going to be peeling. And on a gray birch, it, it's also white, but it is not peeling off. In contrast with the black birch, which is also a very common species in our Northeast forests. And again, you know, twigs and cones aren't really that easy to distinguish. The black birch tends to have multiple catkins at the end of a twig. Um, but again, it's the bark and you can see that young bark. Doesn't that look just exactly like that cherry tree that we looked at not long ago? And it's the adult trees, the, the, the older mature trees that have that very characteristic bark that is kind of a medium gray with a lot of vertical furrows. The bark is, tends to be kind of platy. And so it'll be kind of, you know, somewhat peeling away from the trunk in plates that have usually more straight edges as opposed to the black cherry, which has the kind of rounder edges as it's peeling away. Remember that was the burnt potato chip tree. And so for the birches, you always look at the bark. The gray birch is white, but has those chevrons on the tree and it's not peeling. White birch bark is gonna be peeling. Black birch is going to be that medium gray that's coming off in sort of plates and chunks with vertical furrows. Yellow birch is another one we have in the area, which is not super common, so I didn't put a lot of detail, but it has a, a very distinctive bark, which is this kind of bronzy colored with these very tightly rolling peels as it comes away. So much different from the way a white birch peels off. And lastly, the champ of all trees that can be distinguished from a distance is the sycamore tree. These can get pretty big. They tend to grow in bottomlands. You'll find them near streams and other wet areas. The twigs, if there's any close enough to the ground, you'll find have these kind of arrowhead shaped buds on them. And the fruit of the sycamore forms in these sort of ball shaped um, structures that even this time of year, you'll probably still see some of those on the tree. So that's an easy way to distinguish a sycamore from a distance. But the easiest way of all is just to look at the bark. So the very highest, most um, the, at the tips of each branch, the bark will be pure white. You'll look at it and maybe think it's a, a paper birch from a distance. But as you look down the trunk of the tree, the sort of medium sized branches and upper trunk will have this green brown peeling almost camouflage type pattern on it and the very lowest part of the tree will have this very very light gray chunky pattern 
So it's, it's a really remarkable tree. It has these incredibly different types of bark all on the same tree. So to me, that's always the, the one that's easiest to tell from a distance. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Mike, to cover the evergreens and opposite branch deciduous trees. Thank you, Julie. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that uh, PowerPoint? Sure yeah, can. Looks good. Super. Okay, so Julie did a great job of uh, telling us about um, these trees that have alternate or um, buds that, are, that come out on different sides of the branches in an alternate arrangement. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of those trees where the buds come out opposite each other, like you see in the top left photo. Um, the buds produce leaves and branches, and these two can be used to determine if a tree is alternate or opposite arrangement. But I caution people to be careful because not all the buds make it to maturity. And so if you only look at one spot, you could potentially look at a spot where a bud has died and it may give you the wrong impression. So don't be afraid to look at different parts of a twig or a branch to see whether it's opposite or alternate arrangement. There's only a few trees here in the Northeast that have this opposite leaf or bud arrangement. And people have developed a bunch of different kinds of phrases to try and make it easier to remember them. Here's one of the acronyms people use. It's Mad Cap Horse. M stands for maples, A is for the ashes, D is for the dogwoods, cap is for caprifoliaceae, which is the family of shrubs like honeysuckles and elderberries and blueberries, and horse is for horse chestnut. If you live in the Midwest, you might consider substituting buck for horse because there are more buckeyes in that part of the country. For simplicity here in the field today, we're gonna to divide our deciduous opposite bud trees into two really arbitrary groups. Those that have stout twigs like the ashes, the horse chestnuts and the buckeyes, and those with slender twigs like the maples, the box alders and the flowering dogwoods. So let's begin by looking at one deciduous tree with opposite buds. And this one has stout twigs, it's the white ash. Ash are large trees up to 100 feet tall. They prefer deep, well-drained soils. They're important for timber production, for wildlife. They're often associated with other trees in mixed species groups. Here in our area, the stands that have a lot of ash in them probably at one time had a lot of American elm in them. And when the elms were killed off by Dutch elm disease, it gave the ash an opportunity to uh, take over. Unfortunately, now emerald ash borer, another one of those forest pests we've been talking about, is beginning to eliminate all the ash in our forests. And unless some resistant individuals are found, we may lose ash as well. Up close, there's some characteristics that help us to tell white ash definitively from the others. They have stout twigs, they have dark brown buds at the end, and the buds aren't gummy as they would be with a horse chestnut. Um, the leaf scars, if you look at them carefully, are notched around the bud, and this is useful if you're trying to tell one ash from another. But in our area, most of the ash we see are probably white ash. As Julie's already mentioned, bark is often the best way to tell these trees apart, particularly here in the wintertime. And the mature bark of white ash is gray to brownish gray with these broken intersecting ridges and V-shaped furrow, uh, furrows that you see on the picture in the right. And the older trees develop flat tops to those ridges. So uh, ash can be told apart from other species quite easily by that furrowed bark. If we move on now, we'll look at some other trees in the deciduous opposite bud arrangement. And the first one is the sugar maple. A 
a large tree that prefers deep, rich, well-drained soils, but can grow other places. It's important for timber, for furniture, wildlife, for ornamental use in our lawns. And this time of year, we think of sugar maples for the sap it brings and the syrup we produce from it. Maples and sugar maple in particular are shade tolerant and can replace other trees like oaks in climax forests. Up close, it's easy to recognize the sugar maple by the slender twigs like you see in the top photo. They're smooth and they're the color of maple syrup. The buds are brown and they're narrow and sharply pointed and that will help you to tell sugar maple from the other maples. The bark of young sugar maples can be confused with that of other maples and ashes, but the mature bark is really quite easy to distinguish. We talked about this in the video. If you see bark forming vertical strips that separate away from the trunk on one side only, then you're probably looking at a sugar maple. As the trees get older, that bark starts to fall away and it leaves randomly cracked pieces of bark strip but you can still see places where it's attached only on one side. And that's the key I usually look for to tell sugar maples from others. Let's look at another common native maple, the red maple. A smaller tree, it grows in a variety of habitats, but it outcompetes other species the best in wet areas. So the photo you see here is a red maple swamp here at the Cary Institute. It's shade tolerant like the other maples and can replace species like oaks as forests move towards a climax. Red maples, as the name suggests, have reddish tips to their twigs and two types of reddish buds, oval ones and rounded ones. The oval ones will produce leaves or vegetation and the round ones will produce the flowers. The flowers on red maple are actually uh, appearing right now in our area and they come out before the leaves do. So those are some good key characteristics to tell them apart. Red maple, the young barks again, look kind of like all the other maples, but as they mature, you start to see these dark gray fissured barks. And as they get older, they start to look scaly or even shaggy and those shaggy pieces will scrape off or rub off, leaving a more reddish bark underneath. So that's a great way to see and tell red maple from the other maples. So if we look at these three species up close together, it's pretty easy to tell them apart by their twigs and by their bark. White ash has stout twigs that aren't sticky. Sugar maple, the twigs are slender and the color of maple syrup and the buds are pointy, and red maple, the buds are oval and or roundish and reddish in color. The bark of white ash is, has the V-shaped intersecting ridges. The sugar maple has vertical strips that separate on one side, and the red maple has gray to reddish bark that becomes shaggy with age. And with a little practice, you can quickly tell these from each other out in the field. We're going to move on now and talk about some of the trees here in the Northeast that retain their leaves over several seasons. We call them evergreens. We'll group them into three sections. We'll talk about those that have lead, leaves or that are needle-like and grouped together into bundles. And we've already talked about the pines when Julie mentioned how to use a key. The second group of evergreens we'll talk about have needle-like leaves that are attached individually to the twigs. And finally, we'll talk about leaves that look scale-like in their appearance. First, let's, let's look at the needle-like leaves in bundles, the pines. There's a number of different native and non-native species that are found in our area. Um, and we'll cover one of these as an example. This is how the white pine could appear to you as you approach it in the landscape. It's a beautiful, tall and majestic tree. It's important for its timber and for wildlife. It can have a beautiful shape like you see on the left with a single trunk, or it can appear with multi stems, oddly shaped tree if the leader gets damaged when it's young. Up close, the single feature that tells you this is a white pine 
is if you pull off one of those bundles of needles and count them, you'll see that there are five needles in each bundle. So basically that's the only pine that's native to our area that has bundles with five needles in it. The cones are somewhat unique as well. They're long and somewhat curved, and that also can be helpful in telling them from other species of pines. The bark is a good characteristic, particularly on the older trees. It's ridged and furrowed, but it's not scaly or plate-like as you see on some of the other pines. And this is an example of a white pine on the right and a red pine down below that shows a scaly or a, a platy like bark compared to the white pine. We're gonna switch again. We're gonna look at trees that have needle-like leaves, but this time they're attached individually to the twigs. And there are three groups in our area, the hemlocks, the spruces, and the firs. So first let's talk about the Eastern hemlock. It's a beautiful native tree. We find it, as we mentioned in the video, mixed in with the hardwoods, or it can be a dominant tree by itself or mostly by itself on those northern and eastern slopes. It's important for shading terrestrial and aquatic organisms and controlling temperature. Unfortunately, again, this is a species that's being threatened by an invasive forest pest, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And again, it's a species that's disappearing in our area. Up close, the eastern hemlock can be identified by several characteristics. The easiest is that they have short, flat needles that are attached to the twigs by a small slender stalk. Look at that picture on the right-hand side, the close-up, and you can see the needles attached to the twig with those little stalks. The needles are also arranged on a flat plane on both sides of the twig. And if you turned it over, you see the bottom of the needles have a couple of white lines or ribs running up and down them. So these are the characteristics I look for when I try to decide is it an eastern hemlock? Like many trees, the bark of hemlocks when they're young are difficult to tell from other species, but they tend to be reddish and scaly. And as it gets older, it can become dark and ridged and furrowed. Those ridges tend to be a little bit flatter than what you see perhaps like on a white pine. And if you look up and look at the foliage, of course, there's no confusion between a hemlock and a pine. Let's move again and look at the spruces. In this case, we're gonna use a non-native Norway spruce as our example. Norway spruce was originally from Europe, but it's been widely planted in our area for Christmas trees and for reforestation and for producing timber, probably because it's both deer resistant and it's one of the faster growing spruces. The branches of the mature tree, even from a distance can tell us if we've got a Norway spruce. Look at the picture on the left and you can see the arrow pointing at a low branch that's drooping down and then starting to uh, uh, grow back upwards. Those uh, branches that come out horizontally and then start to go back up are one indication that you're looking at a Norway spruce. An even better indication is if you look at the small branches that come off the larger ones. On an adult or a mature tree, those small branches will hang straight down like you see in the picture on the right. So that's an easy way, even from a distance, to know you're looking at a Norway spruce. Up close, like most spruces, the Norway spruce has very sharp, stiff needles that surround all the way around the twig. There's a saying that it's painful to shake hands with a spruce, and that's a good way to remember that. Norway spruce needles are attached with a little wooden peg that stays on the twig when the needles fall off. So if you see a dead twig on a Norway spruce, it has this unique appearance with a fuzzy appearance to it with all those little uh, needles or little pegs where the needles once were located. Again, bark is an easy way to tell Norway spruce from the other trees, even the other spruces. An adult Norway spruce will have sort of a purplish hue to it. And that's an easy giveaway to me, even at a distance that I'm looking at Norway spruce. It's not furrowed. It doesn't have big ridges. It's sort of uh, flaky or shredded looking, almost in, in some cases looking like that uh, black cherry tree we saw earlier. But of course, this is an evergreen. Finally, we'll look at the balsam fir. 
Uh, we're using balsam fir as an example for many of the firs that do grow here in the Northeast. Balsam is very abundant uh, at higher elevations in the Catskills and the Adirondacks. It's actually uncommon here except where it's been planted. It's an important food for uh, birds and wildlife and provides cover for many animal species, particularly during the winter months. And of course, the fragrant foliage of balsam reminds us of Christmas and decorations and time spent on vacation in the northern woodlands. Up close, a combination of soft, flat needles that attach to the stems or the twigs without a peg uh, are a good characteristic to look for. The needles attach all the way around the twig, but they bend upwards, as you see in the bottom photo. So it starts to look like all the needles are on one side of the twig. And the, the firs and balsam fir included have these beautiful cones that stand upright from the branches. And so if you find them, uh, you've got a pretty good idea you're looking at a fir. And in our area, unless it's been planted, you're looking at a balsam fir. Uh, those beautiful cones are a good reason to put one of these out in your yard, I think. Balsam fir bark, as it gets older, develops these blisters you see on the right. And these are filled with an aromatic liquid resin, another good characteristic to look at in the field and determine what kind of a fir species you're looking at. So let's look at those three trees together. They all have needles that are attached individually to the twigs. The hemlock, the needles are short and soft and flat and they're arranged in a single plane. The Norway spruce, the needles are sharp and stiff and they're attached all the way around the twig and they grow from tiny pegs that remain on the twig when the needles fall off. And the balsam fir, the needles are soft and flat and attached to the twig without stalk or peg. They're attached all the way around the twig, but they tend to bend upwards on older twigs, giving them that look like most of the needles are on the top half. Easy to tell once you know what clues to look for. Last, we're gonna look at a tree that has foliage that's evergreen, but it's scale-like. And there are a number of different species of this here in the Mid-Hudson uh, uh, Mid region and north of here uh, into New England. Eastern red cedar, Atlantic white cedar, Northern white cedar, common, common juniper are all examples that we can find. Eastern red cedar is the example we'll look at. It's a small to medium sized tree. Here it's common in rocky and abandoned fields and old pastures, and it's important food and cover for wildlife. The seeds are widely used by birds during the winter. Up close, red cedar can have both scale-like and needle-like foliage on the same branch. And you see that in the top picture where there's both needles and scales present on a single branch. The bottom photo shows you on the left, the male cones, and on the right, the female cones, or some people refer to as berries that last right on through the winter. Probably the easiest way to tell eastern red cedar is by the bark. It's reddish and brown. It has narrow vertical strips that peel away from the trunk. And the trunk is often not round, but rather fluted. If you cut a uh, red cedar crosswise, you can see the reddish heartwood that's there, and you'll certainly smell the aromatic cedar odor that we think of as cedar chests and cedar closets. So that's a quick review of some of the trees and what kinds of features you might look for to identify them. We've talked a number of times this evening about insect pests and pathogens that have been detrimental to our native trees. This is a map that shows the number of imported forest pests that are found in each of the states here in the US. And you'll see the greatest concentration of these forest pests are here in the Northeast. And unfortunately, New York has the most of any state in the country. These pests are usually brought in accidentally as hitchhikers in wood packing materials or live plants that are brought here for the ornamental trades. And once they're here and established, it can be very difficult to eradicate them. By far the best thing we can do is prevent new introductions from taking place. 
This slide illustrates the annual costs that are associated with forest insect pests in the United States. So this is what it, it's been estimated it costs each year. Um, you can see that the brunt of the costs are being borne by local governments and by homeowners. For example, the cost uh, to local governments for tree removal, replacing trees, and treating insect pests right now is about 10 times what we spend at a federal level to try and prevent new pests from coming in. So there's more that we could be doing. If you want to learn more about this problem, visit the Tree Smart Trade website. It's listed here and see what scientists have identified can be done to prevent future outbreaks. You can help by contacting your local officials and telling them that you support efforts to prevent further escapes of these new pests and pathogen. And there are five actions that can be taken that are listed by the scientists that we can all help to promote. So there you have it, a very quick review of some of New York's very common trees. Thanks for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian. All right. Thank you, Mike and Julie. Lots of great information and many tools to bring with us in our toolbox as we go out and start identifying these trees one by one. Uh, so we have a good amount of questions in the Q&A box, and I'll be volleying them to y'all. And I think you can just kind of uh, fight over who's going to answer <laughs> what, uh, but we have some thoughtful questions and we appreciate all the questions we were able to answer a couple of them as the presentation was being done. Uh, but yeah, let's start off with the Q&A section and feel free to keep the questions rolling in. Um, so the first question we have, and we'll go from oldest to most recent, is the first question we have is how many species of trees in the Northeast? I don't know, Julie, do you? Uh, I pick a number somewhere between a few and a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds. And it also depends if you want to count in the shrubs and the short woody plants as well. Uh, we focus really tonight on the species that um, get up to be of timber size uh, that become dominant in the forest. But there's lots of other trees that are in the understory and don't even make it out of the shrub story. Great, right, thank you. Um, so the next question coming in was, uh, how can you tell an Eastern hemlock from a Western or Pacific hemlock? Wow, I'm such an Easterner and I'm, I've never even seen a Western or Pacific hemlock. <laughs> yeah, I have to feign ignorance again. Uh, yeah. I believe there's some differences in the needles and as well in the cones. So this is where you wanna get out your, your field guide or Google and uh, check it out. And mm -hmm. to be honest, we do that a lot, even though we've spent a lot of time looking at trees. So yeah. don't be embarrassed to look things up. Yeah, and this is exactly why you'll see field guides that are regional. So you'll find a field guide for East, East Coast trees and there'll be a different field guide for West Coast trees for exactly this reason. And I've spent a good amount of time around uh, Western hemlocks and, and have not identified any general broad characteristic that I've noted, <laughs> I think is an easy tell. So yeah, don't be afraid to use those field guides. We have two species of hemlock here in the Eastern United States, the, the uh, Eastern hemlock and the Carolina hemlock. And they have very slight differences. In fact, they're probably very closely related um, in their past history, um, but you can tell them apart by the cones, by the size of the cones. The Carolina hemlock has larger cones. Cool, thank you both. So the next question we have, I find very interesting. Do shagbark hickories do the same as oaks where the production of the nuts varies alternate years? So I'm assuming having kind of like a, a, a greater production of, of nuts from year to year. I think the hickories tend to be much more regular in their production of nuts than the oaks do where the oaks may produce a good crop once every three years or four years. I think hickories do it on a much more regular basis. Is that correct, Julie? As far as I know, yes. And there's also a fair amount of variability among the oak species. Some oaks produce a crop of acorns in a single year and some oaks take a couple of years for the acorns to mature. So there's a lot of differences from species to species. 
But yeah, it's interesting that hickories could produce nuts, uh, crops on a, on a regular basis like that, because there's so much energy involved in producing those nuts and the huge husks that go into them. Shag bark hickories in particular tend to grow in field edges and open, more open areas um, in our area. And so they may be getting more sunlight and more ability to, to produce those nuts because of the energy they can, they can produce. But I think there may be some actual differences between hickories and oaks and how regularly they produce mast. All right, thank you both. Um, so here's the million dollar question. This one's for Mike. Uh, being your neighbor, I am also wondering this. Are the grounds at Cary open yet? <laughs> So you're hearing it for the first, the first tonight. The grounds at Cary will be opening on this Saturday. We're opening a little early because we've been able to get it ready and the weather's been good. So come out Saturday at eight and go for a walk. Excellent. That's just what I wanted to hear. Thank you, Mike. Um, someone asked the question, uh, iNaturalist versus Seek. And just to clarify, I tried to type in, but it, it wasn't letting me for some reason. So Seek is a product of iNaturalist, um, but I believe iNaturalist does have other products. If you're asking for the difference between um, Seek and the, the, what was the leaf identifying app called? Leaf Snap. Leaf Snap, I don't know why that's hard to remember. Um, I've never, have you used both, Julie? Can you speak to the differences of which one you prefer? I've used Seek a lot more. I just find it a lot more straightforward, but, but LeafSnap is good too. Cool, thank you. Um, so this seems to be uh, a comment uh, followed up by a question. So just talking about in a science class in elementary school doing evergreen tree ID, uh, uh, the pine needles uh, come in packages, spruce needles are squared, fir needles are flat. That stayed with me all these years. So yeah, it's cool how um, this information can kind of stick with you. Um, someone also wrote, and I think this is going back, they were the ones that asked the app question. Sorry, these are a little uh, separated. I must have been entering them at similar times. I also find that picture this might be wrong sometimes, but at least it will give you an option or a few options where you can investigate further. Uh, whether I seek or seek just stops and wouldn't offer anything sometimes. So it's another uh, observation about apps. Um, and then someone asks any discussion about black walnuts? Uh, there wasn't anything included in the webinar, but is there any, any information you want to yeah. give on them? Yeah, we didn't cover them in the webinar because gosh, there's a lot of trees that we wish we could have talked about, but we didn't have time. It's not an uncommon species in the area um, and they they are pretty distinctive. They have pretty distinctive bark and twigs. Um, but yeah, I wish, I wish we'd had more time. We could have covered that species for sure. Yeah, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to go out to the field and do this and do the three hour long program like you were mentioning earlier, Mike, that'd be a, that'd be a lot of fun. Um, we have another question uh, and I imagine this would be a variable answer, but at what age do trees generally uh, are considered to be adults? I'm not even sure I could answer that for humans. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it varies a lot from tree to tree. They have different lifespans. You know, some of them like birches are generally fairly short lived and others like oaks can live for centuries. It's very species dependent, I would say. I guess I would think of it as when they start to reproduce, then we can call them adults. Yeah, that's a good answer. Cool. Thank you both. Uh, next question. Uh, spruce gum was a cash crop on the Tug Hill Plateau in Lewis County. What tree produces large quantities of gum? The two spruces you probably found on the Tug Hill would have been white spruce or red spruce. Both are found in the Adirondack areas. I don't remember from my dendrology days which one would have been um, more common in Tug Hill. I don't know, Julie, do all spruces produce spruce gum? I think so. I don't, I think the question is which produces the largest quantity and I don't know 
that I can answer that. It, again, it might depend on where the tree is growing its ability to produce large quantities of gum. Interesting. That's a cool question. Um, next question. Uh, so how do you feel about non-native, non-invasive trees, such as the European hemlock, which appears to be hardier and resistant to the dreaded woody adelgid? Hmm. That's a, that, wow, we could have a whole webinar just on that. Um, I mean, it's, it's a tough question. We have a lot of trees that are, you know, succumbing to a number of, of pests and diseases. And it's, you know, it's, it's good to be able to find something that can be resistant to whatever the current incoming plague may be. But the question is also to what extent can that species replace the native species that is being attacked by whatever pest or pathogen. Um, because remember that trees are part of a larger system. And so, you know, they're, it's kind of, you know, think of it as, as the, the base of the food web. It's not just the tree itself, but it's the native insects, you know, the, the insects that are laying their eggs on that tree and their larvae can only digest that particular species. And, you know, so it's supporting the whole food web. So the, you know, the plant community supports the animal community through all the different layers of the food web. So I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. And there's always, there's always the consideration of the larger picture of the ecosystem as a whole and what's the, the functionality of that particular species within the functionality of all of the hundreds of species that are associated with it in one way or another during its life cycle. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head, Julie. I think ecologists would prefer to have the native species and develop you know, biological control for these invasive pests rather than exchange our native trees for non-natives, even if they're not invasive. Um, it's one thing to have them in your landscape as an ornamental, but to have them replace a, an existing native tree, probably we will miss those trees in terms of some of the ecosystem services they provide. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that domino effect we were talking about earlier in move one, and it seems to have a cascading ripple. Well, great, thanks. That's uh, That seems like a hot topic. And yeah, I think we could focus a whole webinar on that. So thanks for your, uh, your input. Um, Mike and Julie. Um, the next one I can begin to answer a little bit myself. So what's the best way to stay informed about educational hikes, and outdoor classes to learn ID skills in the field? I live in the mid Hudson, New York area. I mean, follow the Cary Institute and Duchess Land Cons uh, Conservancy's Facebook feed, I think is a great way to find it. Look for your local um, uh, land trust and they, a lot of them do educational uh, walks and talks throughout times. And Julie and Mike, do you have any specifics to follow that up? Yeah, those are great. I think New York State DEC at some of its sites also does some really great walks and talks. So keep checking out the places that do this kind of work and um, you'll find plenty of opportunities. Yeah, and certainly go out on your own too. That was one of the things we hope to get across this evening is to, you know, empower you to go out you know, with field guides and apps and one at a time, meet the neighbors, meet your tree neighbors and learn how to identify them. And don't be afraid to, to use your techniques that you were exposed to tonight to try them out on the people you already know or the trees you already know. It's a great way to, to develop your technique, to pick the maple that you already know in your yard and see if you can key it out or see if the app will show you what you think it is. Yeah, start with what you know and move on from there. And yeah, and don't get discouraged. You know, Mike and I are both tree people and we've been studying and interacting with trees for many, many, many years. And it's not unheard of for us to be walking through the woods and to see a tree and have both of us look at it and go, what's that? <laughs> and take a couple of minutes to figure it out because it's not always obvious. Those are the fun ones. Yeah. <laughs> 
Awesome. Yeah. And as I'm kind of beginning my learning journey, I feel that not getting nervous and tackling trees one at a time and, and answering questions that you kind of already know the answer to and guiding yourself by weeding things out is a perfect answer. So thank, thank you for that. Uh, here's a question that could pose a long answer. I am in Ohio. What are the native coniferous trees in this region? I would like to only plant native. I imagine there's some great resources out there when your uh, state's um, natural resource uh, agencies, but do y'all have any answers for that? I don't know. I think of Ohio as being out on the prairie, so I'm not sure what tree species were there 300 years ago, but I would go to your local Department of Natural Resources or universities and see what they have for native Ohio plants. Native nursery too might help too, if you can find a uh, nursery that is tru truly native and not just advertising as such. <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay, what is the effect of tapping sugar maple trees to collect sap, both once and multiple times over the years? Is it harm harmful? And if so, is there a way to make it less harmful? It's a cool question. I think there's been a lot of research done on the impacts of tapping maple trees. And I know there are guidelines in terms of how many taps you can put in or should put in based on the size of each tree. Certain trees, they're too small to tap and then they get to a certain size and you can go with one tap. Um, I think over the lifespan of the tree, if it's done carefully, you probably are having a minimal impact. Cool. Something I've kind of wondered as I've driven by very large sugar shacks with many taps running to their um, their sugar house. Okay. Uh, the next question is about the, uh, invasive Asian bittersweet. Is it less likely to get established in a mature closed canopy forest than it, than it is uh, in edge communities exposed to sun or does it matter? At Cary, we don't see a lot of bittersweet coming into our mature forests where we have um, a closed canopy. We have it as a real problem in, in newly abandoned sites and sites that were abandoned up to say maybe 25 or 30 years ago. So I do think it's more likely to be a problem in sites where there is some surface or some light coming down to the forest floor it may also be a result of the birds that are eating those uh, bittersweet berries are more likely to be in those brushy um, mixed canopy habitats than they are in the mature forest. Julie, what do you think? Yeah, that's very similar to what I've observed. You definitely see it more at edges, especially along roadways. I think those have formed great corridors for invasive species to spread through. But yeah, very seldom do you see it in a closed forest canopy. Cool, thank you both. Um, next question is going back to uh, Wooliya Delta. So um, it's been around for a long time now. Are scientists close to a cure uh, or a predator for it? Yeah, I know there is definitely work going on with uh, biocontrol. And Mike, you might probably know more about this than I do because I know some of this work is happening at the Cary Institute. Um, they've looked at a couple different species that are predators of the hemlock woolly adelgid. I think there's a white fly and a, what's the other thing? I think it's a parasitic wasp. Oh, okay. And I, I'm not sure the actual status of those, to, to what extent are they being released or is it still in the testing stages? Yeah, they've actually been released in different parts of New York State. Um, Cornell University is working with, um, I believe it's USDA, and uh, has developed a number of options and have started to release them in different parts of the state, and maybe parts of other states. There's been work done in Vermont by the University of Vermont as well. And so they are releasing these um, biological controls that we hope will start to reduce the populations of hemlock woolly adelgid and hopefully we'll get them under control so that hemlocks will remain as part of our forest ecosystems. Cool. I like that answer. Um, 
So uh, there's a general question here. Uh, uh, your feelings about planting non-natives, and I'm assuming that, so, you know, given the answer you gave earlier, I bet about, uh, you know, kind of disrupting that, that food web. Uh, is that a general or can you speak to that a little about? Yeah, the, it's, it's a tough question. And, you know, if you ask 10 different ecologists, you'll get 10 different answers, but I mean, non-natives aren't evil. I, I want to stress that plants aren't evil, <laughs> but the, the issue is really it's functionality. How does it fit into the ecosystem? And non-natives tend not to fit into the ecosystem. The, the carbon and nutrients that make them up doesn't cycle in the same way that the carbon and nutrients of a native plant would cycle because the native plants have insects that are able to eat them. Remember, a lot of insects are quite species specific about what they can eat. There's only a, you know, a particular species or maybe a particular genus of plants that they can physically digest. And if that plant isn't available, they won't be able to survive. And so the way I think of it is that the non-natives are not really participating in the food web in the same way that native plants do. Yeah, I, I would agree. At the same time, we have many of our uh, communities, plant communities, where um, non-natives are actually the dominant species already there. And one of the questions is, do we remove them and what replaces them? And right now, some of those non-natives are actually providing uh, ecosystem services to other wildlife and plants in those communities. So it's a, it's a complicated question. Definitely, well, thank you for your thoughtful answers. Um, uh, interesting question coming in. I recall that sugar maples have a high nitrate impact on river tributaries when they lose their leaves. Is this true for other maples? Did you do any of that work, Julie, with your nitrogen studies? I was more in the oak forests. So that was the other group working in the maple forest. So I honestly don't remember um, what the specific impacts are. I'm not sure I can answer that question without referring to the, the data and the, the papers on that. So the decomposition rate of oaks and maples are very different. The maples decompose much more quickly and probably release those nutrients um, into, into streams and rivers or the soils much more quickly. Um, whether that's good or bad, I mean, I think that's normal in many of our communities, plant communities. Right, and it's really very, another one of those species specific things. Um, you know, oak leaves also have a fair bit of nitrogen in them. And I can speak to that authoritatively having collected ground up and analyzed thousands and thousands of them. Um, but the decomposition, decomposition rate, I think, is what's making the difference there. The maple leaves will break down in a few months, whereas the oak leaves will be there for a couple of years. So you don't have that pulse of decomposition of nutrients and carbon going into the soils and the waterways. Cool. Thank you. Thoughtful answers again. Um, I think we kind of addressed this earlier, but I wanted to just stick with it for a second. Um, so chestnut, elm, hemlock, ash, what if anything replaces these lost trees? And I know you had talked a little bit about non-natives kind of filling in the, uh, the resource gap for, for other species, but maybe not filling in the, food, the full food web gap. But what are your thoughts? Well, we don't know. We know that, for example, ash probably replaced a lot of the elms that died off because of Dutch elm disease. The oaks certainly have already replaced American chestnut when that died off. Um, it's gonna be a function of what the other species are in that particular forest stand. Um, something will replace them. There won't be a vacuum. Um, right now, many of the forest stands here in New York and parts of the Northeast are switching over from oak to maple because of a number of factors, one of them primarily being too many white-tailed deer. And so um, we're, we're gonna see changes, but we're not quite sure what, what the changes will create. Um, one of the ecologists here at Cary, Charlie Canham, has done a lot of modeling to look at 
predicting what our forests will look like 300 years from now. And, and he has some ideas, but it sounds very much like um, it can go in a lot of different directions based on what happens here and now. Yeah, and remember species shifts are, are normal in forests. It's just they're happening a lot faster now. You know, if you look at the paleo data from the pollen records going back thousands of years, the populations of different species have shifted over time, but it's just happening to many more species much, much faster now. So I guess stand by and see what happens in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I do want to do a little bit of a time check here. It is 8.30. We've answered over 30 questions through typing and through uh, um, your, your two, uh, both of your graceful answers. Um, how many more do we still have? 20, 23 open now. We just, we just clicked up one more. So uh, do you want to handle a couple more? Or what are your thoughts? Sure, let's do a couple more. Um, okay. And then we probably should let people go. Yeah, we're uh, we still got a good number on, but we have dwindled in numbers a bit. So, all right, well, let's let's move on. So, this question I actually had when we were out in the field filming the videos: uh, What is the purpose of marcescence, and does it give some trees advantages? Go ahead, Julie. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> uh, marcescence. You know, we have a word for it. We know what it is. Why it happens is, a, is another question. It's presumably does convey some sort of advantage to the trees, but not necessarily. Remember that evolution is a journey and not a destination. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle. It's something that I know is, is being looked at and I don't, I don't think I can answer that except just to, um, to revel in how exciting it is that we don't know everything and that there's still puzzles and mysteries right in front of our eyes when we walk through the woods. And it helps us to figure out what trees are out there because not many of them keep their leaves. Yes. Great. Um, I'm going to go the next question. We kind of already covered a little bit. So is there hope for trees like the American chestnut to bounce back with more effort from blights and other diseases? So there's been a tremendous amount of work being done to uh, save the American chestnut. Uh, a couple of different organizations, different schools of thought on how to do it. Uh, some are trying to cross chestnuts, American chestnut with another species of chestnut and then cross back. So you eventually develop a, a, a more pure form of American chestnut but the one that's resistant to the blight. Others at the College of Forestry at Syracuse have been working on uh, using genetic engineering to produce a chestnut that's um, uh, not susceptible to the blight. And I think both programs have developed um, individuals that are blight resistant and we should be seeing them uh, soon, I think. Great, thank you. And I think we'll just follow this up. We have so many more good open questions and we appreciate all your, your time and, and your considerate questions. Uh, unfortunately, time is fleeting. <laughs> so we'll go with one more. And I, I just like this follow-up question to the mar marcescence. And maybe you can just quickly describe marcescence again, Julie, if, if, if folks might not remember what it is, but someone asked what other, uh, what are some other trees that have marcescence? Uh, we talked about the young um, beech saplings uh, as good identifiers for mm -hmm. winter tree ID. Yeah, yeah. So marcescence is something you'll see a lot in um, the uh, beech trees and oak trees are the, the most common ones. And so remember that senescence, which is the process of a tree shedding its leaves in the fall is really, it's an active process. The tree is growing an abscission layer a little bit of cork that kind of shuts off the leaf from the vasculature, the, the pipes basically in the twig. It's you know pulling the nutrients back in for storage during the winter that that leaf has done its job and it's ready to, to be done. And so the tree kind of seals it off um, so that if the tree, if the, if the leaf is, is pulled off in the wind or in a storm, it won't damage the tree. So that's what trees are doing in the fall. They're kind of pushing the leaves off of the twigs. And marcescence is what happens when that abscission layer is formed, but the 
leaf doesn't fall off. And so it's, you know, beeches and oaks are the most common ones. And, you know, we're still kind of speculating on, on why that happens. But it is, like you said, it's a great way of identifying certain trees. Are, those are the ones that I'm thinking of. Do you have any other examples, Mike? No, those are the ones that come to mind. Okay. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your uh, thoughtful answers on these great questions. We have a lot of more good ones, as I mentioned, uh, stuff that could cause a lot of rousing uh, discussion, but unfortunately, we're running a little bit uh, long on time here. So um, we have some information up right now, uh, contact information for the three of us. And uh, Mike, would you like to speak? I, I know that we'll probably be sending out information following uh, the webinar. Yeah, I mean, we'll be sending out a, a link to this recording and we can send out our PowerPoints if people are interested. Uh, I would say look to our websites for additional programs coming up in the future. Um, I should thank um, um, the folks behind the scenes who made this possible. Uh, Leslie Tumblety, who's been guiding us and helping us along and making everything flow. And uh, uh, the folks at Carrie and at DLC who helped to advertise this and make you know that it's going to happen. So um, thank you all. Yeah, thank you all so much. It's been a, a real joy. Yes, thank you all and have a good night. Bye now. Bye. -bye.